Hello, hello. Hola. Good morning. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I say hi? Yeah, say hi. Hi, hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. Hi. Come on. Today is going to be a great class. So, today we have a great, great class. And, and I think by the end of this class, we're going to be very clear about hunger and obesity. Okay, so far, I've been four weeks away from the country. I'm so happy you're still here. So far, so good? OK, so far so good? Yes. I know, I know it's these things we have to work out, but you are the first class. At the end of this, we'll have so much feedback about how to make the second class even better that we're going to love you forever. But today, hunger and obesity, I'm the perfect person. I'm obese and always hungry. <laughs> this is an easy joke. It's a very easy joke. But today is people that they have no option to be obese or hungry. The context of the world they live is uh, the world they live in don't allow them to choose if they are obese or if they are hungry. They are hungry because there's no other option for them. And believe it or not, we're going to see today that some people are even obese because they don't have any other option. Which is what it's unbelievable. Unbelievable that in the 21st century, we will have people that actually are poor and obese. And this is the kind of weird world we are creating. And we should be aware of why. So maybe we have an option of fixing the issue. Anyway, long story short, uh, I think already we recommend you to, um, you read the New York Times uh, kind of piece about salt, sugar, and fat from this Pulitzer Prize Award winner, Michael Moss. I recommend you to read this if you have nothing else to do in your life. You don't have to, but you should. An amazing book if you want to understand why people today eat the way they eat, and they are not even aware. At least if we're going to keep eating the things we eat, at least let's know why. So I recommend you to read this book. So Paula, all yours. I'm delighted to introduce Kim Robin. She's associate professor at the School of Public Health. She's a public health nutritionist and molecular epidemiologist. She studies environmental exposures on food and water systems and the effect they have on cancer and other chronic um, diseases. Welcome, Robin. Kim. Thank you all, and thank you all for coming indoors on such a beautiful day, and um, I hope we'll make it worth it for you today here. So um, actually, I'm going to go back a slide. As Jose said, we're going to be talking about hunger and obesity today, and I am going to set the stage, and I had sort of introduced the topic a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about food and public health. And so I'm going to take it a step further, talk specifically about hunger and obesity. And just to keep things interesting, I decided to reverse the order in how I'm talking about things today. So I'm going to start off by talking about obesity. And basically, I think you all are aware, just so that we're on the same page in terms of definitions, we define obesity as the presence of excess body fat. And we used to think that adipose tissue was just simply where the body stored extra calories. You just had extra calories um, when you took them in, you stored them in your adipose tissue. It was available for when you needed it in the future. We have come to realize recently, probably within the last 10 to 15 years, that actually adipose tissue is really metabolically active tissue and it's critical to health. You cannot live with zero body fat. Um, you do need some body fat. And again, it does serve the purpose of storing energy for periods of fasting. Also plays a mechanical role by protecting us if we were to fall or to have an injury. Um, but we know it plays some other really important body regulation issues. Um, it's important for helping us maintain our body temperature. When we are getting cold, we can actually burn some of what we call our brown fat for extra energy and temperature. 
But what I think is the most important, we'll talk about this in a little bit more, is we're starting to understand it's an endocrine organ. That when you're carrying excess adipose tissue, it actually can secrete a number of different proteins, but the thing that we're most concerned about is the hormones that can be synthesized, including estrogen, uh, leptin, adiponectin, and that has health implications that we're really starting to appreciate. Um, also, it releases cytokines, which for those of you who are studying biology, you probably know cytokines are the uh, initial cell signaling uh, pathway that we have to tell the body that there's an inflammatory process going on and that we um, have something going on in the body that we need to respond to. So um, I hope you have a little appreciation for uh, the role of adipose tissue beyond just um, being a storage spot for excess calories in the body. So how do we as public health professionals talk about having excess body fat? Um, and the most common metric that you're going to see is what we call the body mass index. It makes a really big difference if you're carrying extra 20 pounds if you're five feet even or six foot one as I am. That, that has a... Um, a different effect depending on your height. So we've come up with what's called the body mass index, and it's not perfect, but um, according to actuarial data and a lot of our health study data, it does help us classify when we need to be concerned about carrying excess body weight. So um, I know uh, for some of you who signed up for the class assignment today, hopefully uh, figured out your BMI, do most of you, let a show of hands, who knows their BMI? Good. <laughs> I'll say extra credit Can I today. Something? Yes. Because I promised the class on the first day that you will be following me. Okay. <laughs> All right. I fell miserably, and I'm not saying this happily. And I can give you 100 excuses. But actually, since I began giving the class, I, I got fatter. No, don't joke, I got. In the meantime, I developed four new restaurants. I ate across China, Cambodia, the States, Spain. No excuse. But today, I'm 27.6. And you're actually pretty average. No, For I, I am the average, US. yes. But I'm not happy about it. And <laughs> anyway, long story short, uh, I fell. And I'm not sad to share with you. I'm sad, but I'm not. So that's what happened. But I'm, that's my BMI. It Sorry. happens to all of us when you start teaching courses. But I'm going to get better. I mean, I have many years ahead of me. But I, don't, I said seriously, I, I, we have to become an example. So Sorry, I'll share it next class. Yeah, right. Okay. All right, so I, I do have the categories that we have up here for body mass index, and I think most of you know that a healthy body mass index and what we're looking for that seems to be associated with optimal body health is anywhere between 18.5 and 24.9, although, as I just mentioned to Jose, the average in the United States is in the overweight category, actually. Uh, 26, 27 um, for BMI. Yeah, I, I agree, I agree. There we go. Um, I mean, in the interest of time, I'm just gonna really quickly summarize this. I'd mentioned that the BMI is not perfect. And um, for a lot of you guys, um, especially 20-somethings, um, Frequently, uh, the BMI can't differentiate between muscle mass and adipose tissue. And very often, um, we see young men who obviously have quite a bit of muscle mass, very little body fat, actually showing up in the overweight or obese category. Um, simply on the metric of weight. And so obviously there are some pitfalls. That's healthy, we want you to be in that category. Don't worry about that. Uh, just be careful as we age. That proportion between muscle mass and body fat has a way of changing, and so just be aware of that as you um, go forward in life. 
Um, the reason that we use the BMI is because it's inexpensive and it's easily calculated. Your physician can do it in the office. We can do it when we're doing international studies. We don't need to be bringing you know, computers around to uh, measure body composition. Um, and it's really just the most practical way for assessing and summarizing body composition in our large studies. But as I said, there's the limitation of it not differentiating between muscle mass and body fat. And um, the flip side of that, in the elderly, we can have people who look like they're normal. Um, they're in the normal body weight range, but they've really lost so much muscle mass and replaced it with adipose tissue that that's not good for health either. So at those two extremes, we are concerned about how well BMI performs. Um, I understand last week you saw this series of slides from the CDC about changes in obesity trends over time. And this is based, I'm going to show it again because I, I agree, I don't think that you can see this too often. It really is rather dramatic. But this is data, again, from the CDC based on BMIs. And as you can see um, in this slide, um, the white states are where we didn't have data. This really was data we, that we started collecting in the mid-1980s. And as we start to see more color, this is showing more and more people in the obese range, meaning that their BMI is greater than 30. So we'll just flip through the years here. And I imagine for many of you, this is over the course of your life here. So that is the comparison across all of those ages, or those time points. Um, I think that you can see, I'm not sure that this was discussed last time around, but does anybody see any patterns in uh, the states that are certain colors? Yes? The Midwest. Uh, somewhat. Huh. It's actually more the southeast. The southeastern states, from Texas all the way up to North Carolina, we actually talk about that as being the stroke belt because they tend to have the highest rates of obesity. And along with that, they also tend to have the highest rates of chronic disease, strokes, heart attacks, diabetes. Um, so it is something that's it's definitely a concern for us. And um, there are a lot of efforts in the southeast to um, to try and address obesity-related issues. There's one other outlier. Does anybody know what that is? Yes? Mississippi tends to be the one that kind of leads the way. Uh-huh. that an outlier? Uh, well, that's the, sort of the same um, direction. But yes, it's part of the stroke belt. And yes, they are, although they're making really big strides. I will say that. It's, but there's been a huge public health effort in Mississippi. Yes? Yes? Is he going to say the same thing? I think everyone's honing in on their home state. Am I right on this? <laughs> OK. Uh, Colorado is the outlier, and that is my home state. So um, are you from Colorado? Do you know why? Oh. <laughs> that so shoots my hypothesis here. Um, I, we don't know why Colorado is an outlier. Um, Colorado has a, a population that really values being outdoors, very athletic, a lot of skiing. Yes. Uh, oh, that's a good point. I'm not, oh. Wow. Yeah, wow. I don't know the answer to that. I will have to go back and look at that. I hadn't noticed, I think it's, it's above and off the scale, more than 30%. So, um, so anyways, that is a very active area. Um, Colorado has always been very proactive about encouraging physical activity. Their public health department has been recognized for that for years. So that might be um, an issue or, or an explanation for why they have the lowest rates of obesity in the country. 
Um, I mentioned briefly that there are many, many issues that we're concerned about related to health implications of carrying excess weight. We used to be really concerned solely about cardiovascular disease risk. We know that excess adipose tissue can and uh, fatty acids can accumulate in your arteries and cause blockages and that leads to either strokes if it's in the brain or um, myocardial infarctions or heart attacks if it's in your heart. But again, um, as we've started to appreciate the subtle roles of being overweight, we've started to realize that it's related to a lot of different things. All, you name it, any organ system in the body, being overweight probably has a negative health implication. Um, my own personal area of research is in cancer, and we have very, very active um, areas of research looking at the effects of why is it that we consistently see people who are overweight have higher risks of every type of cancer, and also people who are overweight at the time of a cancer diagnosis tend to do poorer in terms of cancer outcomes. They do less well with surgery, they do less well with chemotherapy. We don't know exactly why, but we think it has to do with the hormonal regulation that's involved with adipose tissue. Um, the other thing that I want to point out on here, because I think you're not hearing about this a lot, but it's going to become an increasing public health issue over time, but we're very, very concerned about what's starting to look like an epidemic of what's called fatty liver disease. We used to think that only happened in chronic alcoholics who were drinking too much and not eating a well-balanced diet. We're starting to realize that almost everyone who's carrying excess body weight is having some of those same changes to their liver. And we can't necessarily see that unless we do ultrasounds, abdominal ultrasounds, to visualize the liver. So it's a very active um, area of work for the CDC because they're concerned about the health implications of having adipose tissue accumulating in such a vital organ. So you're going to be hearing about that in the future as we go on. Um, I also, just like in real estate, you need to be concerned about where your adipose tissue is landing. Carrying excess body weight in your abdomen is much more concerning than having it almost anywhere else on your body. Um, a lot of women are concerned about how our hips and thighs are looking, but it actually should be our stomachs that we're most concerned about. We know that adipose tissue in the abdominal area is highly associated with insulin resistance, meaning that you can't process your blood sugars quite as well. Your peripheral tissues can't take the sugar out of the system quite as easily. We know that uh, people who have the abdominal adiposity have much higher blood lipid levels, high blood pressure. Um, and of course, that, th that combination leads to increased risk of cardiovascular disease and myocardial infarction. And again, um, for cancer risk, it seems to make a big difference. If you've got adipose tissue in the abdominal area, you're at much higher risk for cancers. So um, I just want to briefly mention the costs associated with the obesity epidemic in terms of health. And um, actually, I also wanted to highlight, last week was uh, National Public Health Week. I'm sure you all celebrated, didn't you? The American Public Health Association has a Public Health Week. And uh, this year, they had an infographic contest. And I'm really excited to say that student, GW students took the first prize. And this is actually their uh, graphic. Yeah, no, we're hey, very we excited about That's it. That's great. That's awesome. So um, if, you, if you're interested, go to the School of Public Health website, and you can see the full infographic. It's one, you know, one of those very long ones, so I'm just taking pieces of it. Um, but interestingly, we, we are starting to appreciate that there's direct costs of obesity. The direct cost of um, health care for an obese person, uh, the most recent data we have is, is always lagging a bit. So in 2006, um, obese people, uh, the medical costs for obese people were almost $1,500 higher than someone of normal body weight. And think about that with the number of obese people that we have in this country. That is a large number. Um, so th thinking about it, it's about $152 billion a year in direct medical costs simply related to obesity. 
Uh, the indirect costs, so uh, being having to miss work because you're sick or you're in the hospital or um, having to pay insurance premiums that we all have to pay that get averaged across all of our uh, premiums um, and the potential for discrimination against obese people in terms of the wages that they can earn that also is a considerable cost to the economy, about estimated to be about $6.4 billion a year. Um, and if you think about it, um, just making small changes in the average BMI can have pretty significant cost savings. Um, they're saying over 20 years, just decreasing the BMI by 5% could save the equivalent of 13% of the federal budget which is a significant amount of money. And I don't think people appreciate the effect on our economy of being obese. They don't see the connection between the two, but there really are very clear connections between being overweight and some of the economic issues that we have in this country. So um, you've probably heard, you know, it, Maintaining your weight is a balance between energy in and energy out. It's um, a balance between what we eat in our diet and how much we exercise. And I wanted to put this slide in here because I wanted to make the point that you need to do both. You cannot stop eating as a way to lose weight and you need exercise as a way um, to maintain your lean muscle mass. So you do need to be able to do both. You need a certain amount of calories every day just to perform all your bodily functions, being able to breathe, being able to move. Um, and you need to take in a certain amount of calories just to get the nutrients that your body needs to do all the functions in your um, day. There have been a lot of people who have tried to figure out what is the smallest amount of calories you can take in and still get all the nutrients you need in your diet. And that number is usually around 1,200 calories a day. Um, but you have really got to be an expert to figure out how all those pieces fit together in 1,200 calories a day. Most people need between 1,800 and 2,300 calories a day to maintain their body mass. All right, so um, again, I just want to run through a few definitions so you have that information. Um, calories, you've probably heard the term many times and may not exactly know how to define it. It's um, a, a term that we use in science to tell us how much energy is needed to increase the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius. Um, and that's pretty typical, or pretty technical. You may not need to know that for, um, day-to-day -day living, but you are going to win Jeopardy if it's a question on there now. Um, and it's 14 degrees Celsius to 15 degrees Celsius, if that is the Jeopardy question. But, um, you know, we tend to talk about calories, and in reality, if you look at a food label, it doesn't say calories, does it? It usually says kilocalories. Um, we actually, um, in nutrition, use the terms interchangeably, but what we're really talking about is a thousand of those calories that increase the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius. Um, the other metric that I want to throw out for you guys is that one gram of, or one pound of fat is the equivalent of 3,500 calories. It's an important thing to keep in mind as we go through some of these other slides. I want you to think about that for a little while. Um, and what we like to throw out as an easy way to remember this is if you can decrease your calories intake by 500 calories a day, you should be able to lose about a pound a week of weight loss, which is typically what we find for most people is what can be sustained. Your body is used to that. More rapid weight loss, your body is going to think it's starving. It's going to do things to um, try and conserve energy and spare energy. But a, a pound a week is pretty reasonable. I wanted to show, this was actually, Ellen and I ended up having a little discussion about this slide. This, again, is also data from the CDC. Um, this is from the NHANES study, the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, looking at average energy intake for adults uh, since the early 70s. And, you know, we think, okay, we're having an obesity epidemic, we must be eating more. 
And we are a little bit more. Men are averaging about you know, 2,600 calories a day. Women are, uh, have increased to about 1,800 calories a day. But it's not a huge increase in the average amount of calories we've been eating. Maybe only 150 calories a day increase. But if you think about that over time, that's going to translate into about a half pound a week weight gain times 26. We're talking, you know, 10 to 15 pounds a year, it starts to add up. And that really is enough for us to see those BMI numbers change over time. So it doesn't make a big, you know, it, it, we really do, small changes in your diet really do make a difference in terms of helping you maintain your body weight. So I want to introduce a topic um, that is something that we argue about quite a bit in the field of public health nutrition. Obesity, is it a personal responsibility or is it a result of the environment that we live in? I think that the food industry in a lot of ways would like to have us think that it's a personal responsibility because it takes the onus off of them in terms of having to change or adapt. Um, a lot of us in public health happen to think that we live in a very obesogenic environment. And even those of us with really good intentions of trying to maintain our weight struggle, as Jose can attest and I can attest. I know what I should be doing. It's not always easy to make those decisions. I think the reality is that it's somewhere in between. Um, in order to turn this obesity epidemic around, we do need to take responsibility for our own choices and making sure that we exercise on a regular basis. But we also need to advocate to change the food environment, change the environment that we live in to make it more conducive to being able to achieve our health goals. Um, I wanted to point out this figure, and I promise I won't go through it in um, excruciating detail, but this is one of the uh, optional readings that's on the Blackboard website, and I would really encourage those of you who are interested in this topic to read this. 25 pages long, but it is an outstanding review of where we are in terms of thinking about the food environment. And um, it has been, it was published in 2008. It's, it has consistently, every single year, been the top rated, um, most widely cited article um, from the annual reviews of public health because it is that relevant and it is that important to the field. But basically what they're showing here is that there's many different levels of influences on us in terms of how we make food choices and um, what we need to do to think about how we're going to change the food environment. Um, there are certainly individual factors and personal factors that influence the foods that we eat, our, our food preferences, um, our lifestyle, whether we have time to stop and get a meal, um, whether we're eating on the run. Um, there's also social environments, our social networks, our family, our friends. Do you have friends who are helping you make good food choices or are they sabotaging your efforts to make good food choices? Then there's the physical environment. Um, the, you know, where, what food do we have available at home, at school, at our work sites? Are we making food choices because we have to and that's all that we have available? Or are we actually choosing foods that are really helpful for us? And then there's larger macro level environmental things such as you know, what are the uh, federal laws around food production, um, around, um, I, I'm thinking about the, the soft drink size ban in New York City um, would be another example of some of these large environmental policy issues that dictate how many calories we're all exposed to in our daily lives. So obviously I can't go through all of those um, today, but I wanna just kind of walk you through some examples. There are public health professionals who are working at each one of those levels on each one of these issues that are uh, bullet pointed in this figure. Um, but I just wanna give you a couple of examples. The first one is that environmentally, we are exposed to a lot of calories and that has definitely grown over time. Um, I really like this graphic because it shows how just something as simple as the change in the size of our dinner plates in this country has had a huge impact on the amount of calories that we can eat. Back in the 1960s, when I was going to bring in one of my grandmother's china plates, 
Dinner plates were only eight and a half inches wide. At most, you could put maybe 800 calories on it. Um, but now, we're up to 12-inch dinner plates. And in re some restaurants, not Jose's, he serves small dishes. <laughs> it's good. Um, but in some restaurants, there are huge plates that get put in front of you, and sometimes they're full of food. Um, and what, what really is concerning to me is how many of those uh, endless refill um, offers are coming up from restaurants. Uh, just amazing amount of calories can go in there. But the difference between an eight and a half inch plate and a 12 inch plate in terms of the number of calories you can put on there, it's, it's double the amount. Um, we also know that portion sizes of everything have changed. And um, just look at the difference even in 20 years over the size of common foods. How many of you had a bagel today? In which, <laughs> I was gonna say, probably several of you, and which size was it? I'm guessing the bigger one. It's actually really high. I guess those would be called mini bagels now. Hard to find those. Um, I, I should probably mention, I mean, the difference between those is 200 calories. I mean, that's the difference in average daily intake over the last 30 years, right there just in terms of the size of bagels. Um, and I also, I love the relation to how many calories it would take to burn that off. Um, these are random examples, and obviously the amount of exercise and calories is dependent on your weight and your size, but it would take a 130 pound person 50 minutes of raking to burn off that extra 200 calories um, from the difference in the size of a bagel. Movie popcorn. <laughs> difference, 360 calories over 20 years. And I don't even know what size, I, I think there's bigger sizes now available at the movie theater. Swimming for an hour and 15 minutes to burn that off. And I really love this size. Unfortunately, the pictures aren't the right size. The eight ounce soda bottle should be much, much smaller, obviously, than the 20 ounce soda bottle. But we, it's hard to find those eight ounce sizes anymore, although I know Coke did come out with those mini half cans recently to try and do the portion size control. This exact metric is why New York City was trying to limit portion sizes on soft drinks. It is very easy with liquid things to take in large amounts of calories and not know it. When I was working as a dietitian, one of the things that we always do is we take food histories and we ask people what they ate over the past 24 hours. It was not uncommon for me to run across people who would take in 1,000 calories, 1,500 calories just in beverages. And that's not even the foods that they were eating during the day. So that's where we're getting a lot of excess calories. Um, I want to point out, for those of you who haven't seen this, I think there's a link on the Blackboard site. Brian Wansink, who's a faculty member at Cornell, is a food psychologist and studies why we make the food choices that we make. And he has an entire website with great videos showing all of the research he's done. He's done some really creative research. I just wanted to show um, sort of one of the cartoons from his website that I think really summarizes things well. There are some of us who just happen to make um, wise choices about how we decide what to eat and what not to eat, and others who just seem to be really exposed to everything. But this sort of summarizes all of the things that he's looking at. Um, is you see an overweight person and a thin person. The overweight person is facing the buffet, seeing all the food, eating from a larger plate, eating faster getting more calories in quickly, whereas this, the skinnier person is facing away from the food, not being tempted by it, probably eating from a smaller plate. He's eating with chopsticks in this um, image because it makes you eat more slowly than uh, with a fork. Um, probably uh, uh, talking, uh, putting his fork down, some of these other little tricks that we can do. I just wanted to talk briefly about my own work. We're starting to look at um, the effect of some other environmental exposures, including endocrine disruptors, especially bisphenol A and phthalates that we encounter through the food supply, through food packaging, food processing, and whether some of those exposures may also relate to uh, increasing your risk for obesity. 
Um, we do know that some of these chemicals are hormones and can uh, influence energy metabolism, mitochondrial function, that's how our cells uh, regulate energy, and also uh, insulin sensitivity, so they may increase our risk for diabetes. Um, I do want to briefly mention hunger. Um, I, I think a lot of us, when we think about hunger, we think about obvious protein calorie malnutrition. Now, this tends to be a long-term process. Um, I've got a picture here of washi orcor, which we tend to see in third world countries, long-term uh, overt starvation. Um, that's where you tend to see the abdomen. Also, marasmus is just general wasting that we see with, um, with being hungry. But we, we don't see that very much in this country, and why don't we see this? And this tends to be the result of long-term deprivation of sufficient food in the diet. What we tend to see is a little bit more of the ebbing and flowing of availability of foods in this country. So we don't tend to see those physical manifestations quite the same way. And Jose was talking about how can we have people who are both obese and hungry at the same time. And it's sort of the hidden epidemic that we just don't appreciate in this country. So the USDA defines food security in a couple of ways. Um, we used to talk about hunger and, um, in different terminology, but now we use the term food security. So people can be high. Um, I, I've got the definitions here for you. I'll let you read through those. Um, but food insecurity, basically there's two versions here. You can uh, have reduced quality, variety, or desirability in the diet, little or no indication of re reduced food intake, all the way to reports of multiple indications of disrupted uh, food patterns and reduced food intake. Um, as you can see, this is, uh, again, trends over time since the mid-90s about food security. And as you can see, around 2008, when we had the downturn in the economy, a big jump in food insecurity in this country. So um, it's becoming even something that we're very much more concerned about in this country. Um, the largest food support uh, network that we have for ins food insecure people in this country is a program administered by the U.S. Department of Agriculture, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or SNAP. It used to be known as food stamps, and in 2008, they changed the terminology. This program is funded by the Farm Bill, so this is something that has current political re relevance, and I want you all to be keeping that in mind. Um, there's a variety of different eligibility criteria, which I have listed for you. Again, it's available from the resources that are on the Blackboard website if you would like to look at that. The one thing that I want to... I'm sorry. <laughs> I will wrap this up. I know, because a lot of this ties in with what um, Alan's going to be talking about, so we'd love to... Okay. Thank you. I do want to make some point, a couple of points here, though, because it relates to your assignment for those of you who are doing your assignment for today. Um, I do want to say that the, the SNAP benefits are regulated by the states and there's a variety of different metrics that are used to determine what the SNAP benefits are for individuals. But uh, last year, the average for a single person monthly benefit for SNAP benefits in the District of Columbia was $137 a month or on average $4.59 a day, so not very much money. And again, you have the website here, you have links to some of the SNAP resources on the website. Um, I do think this is a really important point that I very much want to make, is that how can people be both food insecure and obese? I think we've talked in other classes about the fact that the least expensive foods that are available to buy out there tend to be the ones that are highest in calories, fast foods, um, beverages, it's, it's easy to take in a lot of calories for not spending very much money on sugary beverages and fast foods. Um, there's limited availability of healthy foods in a lot of areas where people who are receiving SNAP benefits live. We talk about having food deserts in areas that are, where we have low socioeconomic status people living. We're also developing a new term now called food swamps. These same areas that don't have, uh, that are food deserts and don't have access to fresh uh, foods and grocery stores also tend to be the highest concentration of fast food outlets. So that's what we're referring to when we talk about food swamps. Um, these people are busy. They have a lot going on. Nutrition may be the last thing that they're thinking about. 
Um, so it may be a lack of nutrition knowledge in terms of the food choices that they make for their family. But the one thing um, that I do want to mention is that the inconsistent food access, having SNAP benefits at the beginning of the month and running out at the end of the month may result in overeating earlier on, lower eating uh, later in the month, and those swings in caloric intake we think are um, part of what leads to increased storage of fat in the body. The body is trying to overcome being um, restricted and it thinks it's going through famine and feast um, scenarios. So we think that might be why we're seeing obesity in uh, people who are hungry. Um, I want to leave you with this slide of what can we do about this. I don't want to leave on a doom and gloom note. There are a lot of things that we can do. And the thing that I want to encourage you all to do the most is think about changing the food environment. Know your legislators and know what their positions are on food, nutrition, and physical activity policies and legislation. And encourage them to support legislation that helps everyone be healthy, especially the farm bill. Um, I want to mention that um, I suggest that you all try the SNAP challenge. And I know a group of students in the class are doing the SNAP challenge right here in the front as um, one of their class assignments, one of their group assignments. And they're going to be handing out materials after class about the SNAP challenge and how to do it. And so I hope you will all sign up and participate to do that. Um, I have some other things here, um, but I am going to let Ellen talk about these because I think she's going to address them as well. But on the other side, I do have some tips for um, taking responsibility to help you maintain your own weight. And then I promised Jose that I wanted to mention again, a uh, place at the table um, that you all try and see this. I don't believe it's anywhere locally in the theaters anymore if you haven't seen it, but it is available uh, from iTunes. Uh, for $7. So it really is a phenomenal um, explanation of what's happening in this country and what it's like to live on SNAP benefits. So with that... It's okay. I, don't introduce me. <laughs> I'm going to tell my story. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to introduce Ellen Gustafson, who is going to come and tell her story. So thank you. <laughs> it's easier. Thank you, Kim. But yes, I want to say, She's a great friend, and I'm so happy that she came all the way from California to Washington to be here with us. And I brought so the weather thank with thank you me. very much. And I clearly so brought I only want to know who you went from being an ABC reporter on terrorism to be a, an expert and a, a leader on hunger and obesity. I'm going to tell the story. Don't worry. So go. Um, hi, everyone. I'm really psyched that there's California weather here, um, although it's a little sweatier here than California, so sorry if I'm still a little moist, which is like, I feel that way every time I come to DC, like winter or summer. Um, anyway, so I want to start with uh, following up. I think you guys got a lot of great information uh, about the, the, the facts about hunger and obesity, like what it actually, the impacts on the, on the, on the human, on the individual. The, the way I've started to look at these issues and, and my, my own personal story, which I'll tell you a little bit very quickly, is actually to look at the system. And I think it's so relevant because what, what you were just introduced to is the fact that there's, of course, the individual responsibility element of all of these things. We all eat and make food choices. But there's the system that we're living in and in which we're making those choices that's really as important, if not more important. Um, and at the end, I think what, what Kim started to introduce is that I do believe, and I think a lot of people and practitioners believe, that we can change the system, but that it's going to take a collective group of individual actors to change the system, as it does with, with any major you know, social and, 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 uh, and political issues that we have um, across, the, across the country and across the world. But I want to start from a, from a very positive perspective. My, my work started internationally. When you look at international issues, especially hunger, it's really easy to think that it's all depressing and, and you know, sad. And those, those images of those babies with swollen bellies are, are really sad. But I think the point is, we can feed the world. And now I'm realizing that. The fonts are going to be messed up because clearly we're doing this on a PC. So just FYI, I, all, all my Mac friends out there, my fonts were a lot cuter. So don't be mad at me. Um, so, so, but, but I think the most the pre pressing question of our time, 
And in many ways, this is a bit of a generational issue, but it's not can we feed the world. It's can we feed the world well. We can feed the world. We produce enough calories today to feed the whole world. The question is not are there enough calories. It's can we get the right calories to the right people where they are with relevant food choices. And I think we have to remember that when looking at all of these variety of issues. We have to change the question sometimes to get the answer that we really want. And the, the second most important thing to start off talking about food is that food is awesome and that it's not negative, it's not the devil, it's not the, the enemy, it's, it's, it's our friend and you know, it's, it's an important part of what we all do. Every cultural tradition in the world has food at the center of, of whatever their, their, their gathering is, whether it's religious or, or, or ethnic. So food is a wonderful part of the human experience and so by making it the enemy, which in many ways we've done, especially in the last 30 years, we've really ruined a majorly important part of what food is to ourselves and to people around the world. Um, but, but to start telling my story, I will, went there. Um, so, so this weird slide, just to give you a little bit of background, I first worked for the military. Um, I graduated college in 2002, and 9-11 actually happened my senior year. I was up at Columbia University, and I started to work and, and focus on terrorism issues. And yes, I did work at ABC News in the terrorism investigative unit. But what I noticed is all these mad people around the world also tended to be living in regions of food insecurity. Well, and so if you think about that from a per very personal level, when I'm hungry, I'm not fun. And if I just extrapolate that to a community level and to a cultural level, that's a general rule. When people are hungry, they're pissed. So it's, it's, it's pretty easy to see that the regions around the world that are terrorist hotbeds have also struggled with food security for a long time. So what, what, what I noticed is that the places that we send aircraft carriers are the mad places. They're terrorists, they're mad, they're angry about something. We send the aircraft carriers to potentially fight wars. Well, there's another way we can send a large ship over, and that's where I kind of move my career. I started focusing on terrorism and realized I instead was really interested in this whole food security and insecurity uh, connection. And so I began to work at the UN World Food Program, sending these ships, but instead of, of weapons on the, on the decks, most of it was food. And that's the way that we've been sending aid overseas. So we kind of are shifting from mad people sending food aid as, as a possible solution. Well, what I eventually realized, and what I'll tell a little bit more in the story, is that we ended right back up at MAD. And MAD is an acronym for the Modern American Diet. So after 30 years of sending food aid on these ships, what we've done in many places is hooked people on the Modern American Diet. And what we've actually come to see is Egypt being a perfect example of this. But after people have spent the last 30 years you know, receiving our food aid, changing a lot of their diet, Egypt is now the largest importer of wheat in the world. And when wheat supplies that are a global commodities exchange get disrupted, people just get mad again. So, so maybe the answer isn't leaving people hungry or sending US food aid on US ships or outsourcing the American diet, modern American diet. We maybe have to think through a different solution to both this food insecurity problem that's causing terrorism and the eventual outcomes that do end up causing unrest even when people do have enough food. So, just to think about the aircraft carrier, my, my friend, uh, looming in the background. So I then realized while working at the UN World Food Program and being frustrated by the fact that we were you know, sending a lot of food on ships, that food, the story of food, was everywhere. So in, in the mid-2000s, really these stories started to just bombard us. And the outcome of, of these magazine covers and, and newspaper stories is actually you guys sitting here today. Because when I was in college, there is no way that there would even be thought of a class about food, about the world on a plate, at, at, a, at a major high-level you know, university. And what's amazing is that this, this, this series of, of public awareness and articles and, and studies actually changed the conversation for young people. So that the fact that this class was, was I think, oversubscribed over, uh, in like 24 hours is such a sign of the times, as are these Time Magazine covers. The time is now that people are talking about these issues. And I recognize that, especially when I started to work at the UN World Food Program. So what I saw there was a wonderful intervention, a way to give kids a free school meal. It's, it's this, the, the, the International School Feeding Initiative is exactly like what we do here in America. Giving kids a free school lunch gets them into school, gets them to focus on their studies. It's, it's what we do here when kids can't afford to pay for school lunch. So, oh, the fonts. So, so, so I started a company while, while working at the UN World Food Program called Feed. 
And really the basic idea was let's use a fashion product. Let's use this sort of you know, consumer interest in social good to help provide meals to hungry kids. And you know, in visiting these places around the world, you can see this does these meals, the, even though this is a corn soy blend product shipped on that US big aircraft carrier boat, it's still getting kids into school who otherwise wouldn't be there. And it's giving them something to nourish them so that they can think about their, their, their classes. Another part of running this company was actually producing products around the world. And that actually got me thinking about food. The production of these bags got me really thinking that it's the systems locally that are going to help these people change their own lives. And so producing these products around the world was a great way I, I learned that local answers are probably the best way to change some of these big problems. Oh, the fonts. So we, we were a successful business. We provide, have provided, still running today, over 60 million school meals to kids around the world just by selling products. It was an amazing ride. But there was this nagging voice in the back of my head. And it came from trips like this one in Uganda where I could find a Coca-Cola anywhere. I could find packaged like wheat, processed wheat, whatever, white flour cookies or something. I mean, anywhere. Chips, anywhere. Pringles, they're like everywhere. And the amazing thing is that I don't eat all that junk. So how am I, in rural Uganda, going to find something to eat? Well, ironically, the hungry people are dealing with the same problem. Coca-Cola is, avail is available in more countries than are recognized by the United Nations. It's like not pr a hard thing to do to find calories in many places around the world. What's hard is find finding the nutritious foods to feed ourselves well. And so around my 30th birthday, I was thinking and looking at this data. And you just saw a lot of it right here. And I'm going to go through it pretty quickly. And I noticed that I was born in 1980. When you look at those maps, it's like stuff started to get real bad around the time that I was born in both the, 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 the obese, obesity epidemic that's plagued the world and these problems of hunger that have stayed with us, even though we have this amazing technology and, and we should have the answers to solve that problem by now. So in noticing the fact that, look, globally, yeah, hunger, hunger dipped a little bit in the 90s when everyone was like rolling around in, in the, the money that I apparently used to be given out for free. Uh, miss that, um, but 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 you know so so we, we've we've dramatically raised especially in the last five years the number of hungry around the world we've seen this except for our friend Colorado um, that that obesity has most certainly been uh, ballooned not only here in America but but really all around the globe we we've exported the MAD the modern American diet to places around the world they're now eating more like us and they're having the exact same health problems that we are you know a couple days ago was world health day and the focus was hypertension and you'd think how is that like global issue because we think of these problems with you know our, our, our eating too much salt or, or being obese as such american problems but actually hypertension kills more people in africa because the diet is so bad even when people do have food they're eating things they're eating sort of the modern american diet and and they're dealing with the exact same health problems that we have here at home so here's this, um, this amazing data point that you can have one individual human that's both hungry and obese. And you guys got a little bit of that um, before. And it's just so important to remember that these things are not different. I argue they're actually exactly the same. And I think my experience in Uganda looking for nutritious food and only finding the, the, the junk food that I would never eat here at home is such a good indication. You, know, you get on the plane and you fly back and land at like JFK airport like I used to do. And funny enough, the food choices were exactly the same as in rural Uganda. I could find soda, I could find cookies and chips, but could I find the, the good, nutritious, fresh foods I wanted to eat? No. So ironically, people here at home were dealing with a very similar problem that people around the world that we think of as the other were dealing with. So when you look at these things like one global malnutrition crisis, it gets you thinking about, first of all, what caused this one crisis, and then what will we do to end it? Well, so of course, you have to understand where does food come from? <laughs> Everyone knows that acronym. It's not where does food come from, um, and 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 so I you know I, I'd read this 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 hero Wendell Berry, and his, one of his famous quotes is eating is an agricultural act. Well, I didn't know anything about farming, so time to go figure it out. So here's two stories about farming that are pretty illustrative of the obesity and hunger, hunger academic, uh, epidemics around the world. One. A woman farmer who represents about 80% of farmers in the poorest parts of, of mainly Africa, Latin America, and Asia, who doesn't have access to resources, who doesn't have access to, to great land and, and irrigation. And the other, which is me on a grain bin, because in some ways, I'm just as connected to the land that many of the farmers that are growing our food are today. You know, it's, it's a lot of big corn and soy companies that are producing massive quantities of foods that we don't necessarily need to eat. And what we've seen also since 1980 
in reflecting these changes in who the farmers are is a lot of crazy changes in really important data. So the number of farmers, especially in America, has dropped. The farmer's percentage of the dollar has dropped quite dramatically. Agriculture aid has gone down, and now instead we're shipping the food on the big aircraft carriers. Public money for research and, and independent research coming. I mean, you guys are lucky to be at a place like GW that, has, that is a research institution. So many of the research institutions that are looking at agriculture, especially in the middle of the country, are like the Monsanto School of Corn Research. I wonder what they're going to find when they do that research. And, 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 and so we, 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 we've lost that, that independent voice and look at, at all of this data. And in this time when there's been a rampant you know, increase in, hung, in hunger around the world, and you'd think that you'd have farmers growing more and more food, actually African agriculture, and specifically corn production, has, has, has been reduced by 14%. Well, is that connected to the fact that we've been sending corn and soy on big US aircraft carriers all this time? Potentially. But also, consolidation has massively increased, not only in agriculture, but also in food. The temperature has gone up. The number of natural disasters has gone up. High fructose corn syrup and GMO crops were entirely created and first available on the market since 1980. 1984 is actually the year that both Coke and Pepsi switched over. Is that a coincidence? Or does that have to do with the food policies and the pro-corn and soy policies that we're implementing that have then led to both the continuation of hunger and also our obesity epidemic? Well, I would, question, I would say that's a pretty good place to start. Corn is literally in everything. It's in our cars. It's in our soda. It's in our meat. It's the reason that, that, that food becomes artificially cheap because of highly subsidized agricultural inputs like corn. It's not that people are just making bad choices. It's that they're making rational choices that are irrationally priced and that we haven't thought through how to, how to right that wrong. So think about this. Just in the past 30 years, this whole obesity epidemic, it's become more expensive to eat the foods we should be eating and cheaper to eat the foods that we shouldn't. And we wonder why only it's a couple hundred calories. It's also a couple hundred of the wrong calories that we're now eating. And is that having a bigger impact on our waistlines than it would if we were just eating a couple hundred more calories of blueberries? Well, this is a really good, another great indicator slide that the people are actually making quite rational choices with their food dollar. It's the policies behind those choices that really need to look at. You know, when, when soda becomes the cheapest option, soda's probably what a lot of people are going to drink. And that's something we have to question way back at the farm level. Is that the kind of food that we want to be subsidizing? So one, one interesting data point is, you know, this new My Plate that came out. Our agriculture policies don't reflect this at all. We're supposed to fill half our plate with fruits and vegetables, and American farmers can't even grow enough if all of their fruits and vegetables were counted to allow Americans to do this. I think that's a really big indicator that our policies are pushing the wrong things, and we're not yet growing what we should be eating, which is, of course, the foundation of getting people to eat a healthy diet. So again, these subsidies have dramatically increased the amount of fast food that, that, that people are eating. And, and of course, if you're a busy family, just like we, we looked at before, you're, and, and you can stop by the drive through and artificially buy a hamburger for something like $1.99 or 99 cents, yes, you are going to do that. And no, you individually are not some bad human being for doing that. You're making a rational economic choice. And we, as caring people, are the ones that need to think about how that can possibly be rational. So the system is broken. In places like Mississippi, you have the highest number of the hungry and you have the highest number of overweight. And it's the same thing globally. In places like India, where we formerly, even just a few years ago, thought of as bastions of hunger, they still are. But ironically, they're also bastions of diabetes. So how did we build a system to answer the problem of hunger that have just created another problem? Well, when we look at, at, at healthcare spending to food spending, obsessing over having the cheapest food supply in the world has perhaps not been the right focus. And maybe if we can build in some of the costs of our healthcare system to the cost of food, we can right some of this, this irrationality that comes in, in our spending habits. So I wonder, you know, should we be talking about healthcare at all if we're not talking about agriculture? Should we be thinking about Obamacare or should we be thinking about like Obama Farm? And, and, and what's that going to look like? And again, numbers that you've seen before. But, but all these other political issues are built into our food supply. You know, the whole immigration debate, that's a food, that's a food question. 70% of the people that are, that are producing, picking, processing our food are undocumented workers. And, 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 and what's going to happen? So, so we're just going like, to let those companies go and keep you know, bringing those people in seasonally? Who's going to pay for that? And that's a question that's not embedded in the immigration debate yet, but it should be, because it's actually a food debate. So I would argue that looking at all this data, it's time to rethink the system. 
It's not time to keep telling individuals who are hungry or individuals who are overweight that they themselves somehow are the problem. We have to look at where, whether or not the system actually has touch points that we can change to improve it for all of us. I mean, I can personally say for myself that I don't want to spend the next 30 years obsessing over what I can eat to fit into my pants. And that's honestly how I've lived the past like 15 years, and it sucks. And I think we deserve a better food system than one where we have to go way out of our way to make an effort to just be normal weight. That shouldn't be the, the alternative, that should be the norm. So I created this organization called The 30 Project that was looking at, hey, it was 2010, when you look back in the last 30 years, things have gotten really bad. And in 2010, there were a billion hungry and a billion overweight. Today, there's actually a little less hungry and a little more overweight. I don't know if that's an improvement at all. But what, what I thought at the time was, we need to change the conversation so that we have a long-term plan for what's going to address both of these problems and not one or the other. And what I think we have to remember is that we do have some power, especially sitting here in this room in Washington, DC, with the choices that we do make. Now, that's not to say that's it, that once we make good choices, everything's going to change. It's to say that we can buy into a healthier system. And I think that's a really important part. And I'll just end with this, with this, this couple of data points. Look, we have made a choice. The younger generation has already chosen with their dollar what we want. And if we continue to do it, we will shift these systems. The fact that there's this much growth in farmers markets is pretty radical. And it's the same thing with CSAs, community supported agriculture, where people are buying directly from farms and having a box of food from that farm getting shipped to their house. That's direct farm to consumer dollars that are not then going into this other big system. It's essentially saying, screw the man, I'm buying outside of the normal system. And that does help change things. If you look at the fact that consumers are choosing foods that are identified with being clean or pure, they're going to restaurants where they feel like they know where food is sourced and that someone actually gives a crap about it. People are, 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 are buying local, not just because it like, feels good and like Joe the farmer down the street, because it feels safe. It feels relevant. They're keeping their dollar in the local economy. Those are all things that are embedded in way other political realms, but they should always be included because of the importance that they have for our health. You know, even, even this, like fair trade, it seems so random, but like most colleges, I mean, most places I go ar around the country, fair trade coffee is kind of becoming like embedded in the norm. Like that's what we do, that's what we get, that's what we want. And that level of demand actually does eventually change the system. I mean, no one wants to be on a diet anymore. No one wants to have to say, I'm going to make a different choice. I'm going to go outside of the normal you know, group, uh, social norm, because I, I need to keep my weight down. It should be the norm that we can eat foods that make us healthy and not obese and not hungry. When you look, though, at, at the trends that are coming up across the food supply, it's things that are helping to move in the right direction. Like, Kale is a trend. I know that sounds so random, but green juice and kale is honestly a trend that these like nerdy restaurant consulting blah 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 people are thinking about. And like I think that's really powerful. And that's something that young people are leading. And that's not just like, oh, rich people are gonna eat kale. It's act it's going to eventually make kale a highly demanded product that will then become cheaper because by the way, anyone who's ever taken an economics class, that's how it freaking works. I mean <laughs> So the, the, the point that everyone tries to say about the, 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 the status of like the, the alternative food system is like saying cell phones are the alternative mode of communication. I mean, yeah, they were 10 years ago, and then everyone wanted a freaking cell phone. That's exactly what can happen in the food supply. We can do the same thing that we did with computers. We can do the same thing we do with cell phones. We can do the same thing we do with, with any technology. We can build the alternative system, buy it, and then make it the norm. And that's the power that we're sitting on right now with the fact that this room is full. That there are enough young people who give a crap about this that will then change the system. And there's nothing on that slide. So there is something on this slide, which, which is that there's tech companies that are, that are starting to build this out. The system might not change in a supermarket. A supermarket might not be the way that we buy food in the future. And if we're open to that, we solve hunger and obesity by building an entirely alternative system. In doing this, this is the last couple slides. And this is what I think is the most important in thinking about whatever you do with research in this space, thinking moving forward. We need to develop new metrics. We can't just say yield is the way that we measure food. We can't just say how much is the most important thing. We, we, we can't assume that free markets 
are, are divining what goes into the supermarket shelves when we know that's bullshit because we know there's a lot of other money and marketing and subsidies and all that other stuff behind it. If we want real free markets, we'd go to the farmer's market because that's where you actually have information and real pricing. And we have to demand that all the way up the, the supply chain. We also have to demand that biodiversity and things like the fact that most of the, th most of the foods we eat are just three crops when humans have eaten like thousands and 17,000 varieties of wheat in our history and we only eat like two now, we have to demand that that changes. And, and, and we have to think that maybe farmer health should be an indicator of how well our food system is doing. If farmers in America are all obese and unhealthy and farmers in Africa are, are, are all hungry and unhealthy, which is the truth for the most part, that should be metrics that we care about and that we want to change. We also have to have new objectives like farmer health, but also could, could changing the healthcare spending you know, policies be an objective for our food supply? Could, could, could making the value meal mean something different in terms of what the values are and not just price? Is that something that we can change as a metric so that people think differently about the food that they buy and the dollar that they spend on it? And the one big question about hunger around the world is, once everyone eats meat like we do, they're all going to be starving. What if they don't eat meat like we do? And what if we don't eat meat like we do? Because we don't anymore. If you see the trends of meat, they're actually leveling off. Young people are choosing to have meatless Mondays. We're eating things differently. But here's the last most important piece. Einstein had a famous quote that the definition of insanity is trying to do the same thing over and over again to get a different result. So I would argue that if you are talking to a person who has been in charge of the food system for the past 30 years, like I do all the time, and that 70-year-old man says to you, but how will we feed the world? I would say back to him, you will not feed the world because you will be dead. <laughs> and I will certainly not feed the world the way you have for the past 30 years that has jacked up the entire system. So I would argue that what we need to do is think about how we will feed the world differently in the future. And different is going to have to be the answer because that is the only way we can ever get to better. So here is, we need a new model of the food system. We got that. And it starts at the table. There was a picture of the table there, but it's gone. So by changing dinner, <laughs> we can change everything. We can change the agriculture system. We can change immigration. We can change trade. We can change so many things. I know Jose does do that at his restaurants. The jobs that are created, the people that are there, the health that comes out of it, the local economy that's being built around Penn Quarter, which is so rad, not, not in a small part because of you, is, is that's all changing because of food. And we see the power of that. That's amazing. So again, who's we? If we are going to feed the world, who's we? And if we don't do it, and if really smart young people who care about this and took this class don't do it, no one will. And if we don't make the right choices, we will never build the food system of the future that will be a different system. So here are my new organization's food tank. That's just it. I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> We have time. So it's funny that you said the kale thing, because a month ago I came back from one of my trips, and my wife had a big bowl of kale in the kitchen. And she kind of made a dish, which was kale roasted in the oven. And she was so proud. She forgot one ingredient that was oil. <laughs> She put the salt, but anyway, it was delicious. But it's very funny. You mentioned the kale now, because my wife was like, this is a cool thing. It's, it's a, cool. It's Kale's a cheap. cool. Kale's so, cool, right? Like every restaurant anyway. has it, right? Yeah. So uh, I don't know if last week you follow, I was in Spain, all it's the delicious. controversy of President Obama in California about the Attorney General. I mean, we invite her because she's so smart. It's obvious. <laughs> that was supposed to be a joke. <laughs> so we have questions? Yeah, questions. You are always around for questions. I love you. <laughs> Without you, I don't know what we will be doing here. Hello. <laughs> um, I have two questions. One, uh, what's, what's the common factor in countries that are outliers? Like, for example, the country where I'm from, I remember that all I wanted when I was little was a Dunkin' Donut. And they opened one shop in Buenos Aires. Mm. And I really wanted to, and it flopped within a month. No one was buying donuts. And I, as a little American child, couldn't get my mind around, like, well, what, why don't people love donuts? And obviously, it's a cultural thing. On that map, Argentina is one of the only countries who's not you know, generally overweight. And I was wondering why that is. And secondly, I just wanted to say that I totally agree. We're doing a project. We're trying to find a chicken to kill for our 
our project because we want to, you know, show people where food comes from. Nearest chicken is two hours away. How can that be? We just want a chicken. I'm even trying to buy one online. <laughs> and I can't even buy my own chicken. And now my alternative is to like raise a chicken and then kill it when all I want is one live chicken. I can't even get one from a pet no. store. So, yeah, so, so I mean, I would, I, would say, I would say the outlier thing is a really important thing. And if you look at, look, Europe, I mean, Argentina actually fits in with the general um, formulation of European food policy because a lot of what they do follows a lot of European food policy. But the, the, the sad thing is they're just more slowly following the modern American diet. It's actually coming. It's just coming a little bit more slowly, unfortunately. The power, though, is that there are systems in place there because of the way the, the country was, was built over time that are protecting people, whether it's the, the local diet is, is, is still culturally really powerful or it's that there are, you know, Argentina is a good example. That most of the beef is still pastured and that actually no one's studying this yet, but what if pastured beef is, is, is somehow independently an unbelievable metric for how healthy a population will be? Because they have higher omega-3s in their beef, they have you know, leaner beef. I mean, that, that in, in and of itself could be a reason that Argentina is protected from some of these things. So what we, what we need is to look at metrics for places like that that are different than what we've been looking at before. Oh yeah, the chicken thing is so effed up because because right over here in, in the eastern shore of Maryland is like Tyson Land, and they absolutely own the entire vertical operation between egg to grocery store, and honestly, that's the answer. And so we should be literally riding on the streets that there is one company that owns that many, that much of our chicken market, which is it's they they they, are, they own like thirty percent of the entire chicken market. Not here. Not, in, not if you're, you got to get outside of Tyson land, and then you got to go to California to do that. Oh. Sorry. Questions? OK, so there was a story, and I want to say the AP or something like that, about a month and a half ago, two months ago, about Bolivia. And the story was about how quinoa, which was a fairly big staple in Bolivian diets for a very long time, because wealthy uh, Westerners in the United States and Europe have started to eat more quinoa in their diet as a replacement for meat and other things like that. It's caused the, pr the global price of quinoa to rise. Not very much, but it's enough that people in Bolivia were basically rioting over the price change of this sort of staple good. As wonderful as it is to say that we need to build a new food system, is it, should we expect that while our food system transitions from what it is now to what we kind of want it to be, will the next couple of years, decades be difficult in terms of the transition from this big mechanical agricultural method to sort of the new way of thinking about food, which isn't so corporatized, isn't so meat heavy, isn't so, as you said, kind of three, three yeah. basic crops. So, so I have a couple points on the quinoa thing. One is, it, this is a perfect example of, where, of, of, of being in a moment of something and having the, the capacity to do something about it, right? We're watching this unfold in real time. As people are demanding more quinoa, the whole Andes region is potentially growing it only for export, not eating it anymore, and then losing the, the nutrition, right? But they also secretly want to get the money instead because they want to buy the, the McDonald's and the Coca-Cola because they've been so embedded with this marketing image of like the happy white girl that looks like me eating a burger, and they all want it, which is so effed up in the first place. But, but I, I th so I think there's a couple of things. One is we have to make sure that our bilateral trade agreements are embedded with stories of things like quinoa. And so a good example of this is that NAFTA has been a major, major problem for local Mexican corn farmers, so much so that most Mexicans eat American corn. Hello, it's the birthplace of corn. And, and so we have to make sure that we're, when we're talking about food, we, we don't just think, oh, I really want to eat more quinoa. We're actually looking at US trade policy. And I know that sounds crazy, but we need some people that are smart enough and that realize the connections between the way we consume as Americans and all these other embedded political issues. The other thing I'll say is that we actually do have a choice right now, which is to say when you go to the grocery store and you've read this article, just look for fair trade certified quinoa. And I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not putting that on you. I'm saying th that's, that's a cultural thing that we could demand like we do chocolate and coffee and sugar in some ways. And we could say, we're not going to do this to, these, to these, you know, these Bolivian farmers like we've done to the banana republics, to, to the coffee growers. We're not going to do this with quinoa. We're going we're gonna to be more enlightened this time. And we're going to make sure that it's fair trade. And we're going to make sure that people are getting fair wages. And, and, we're not, and also, we've got to figure out how to grow quinoa here. 
And, 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 and you know, that's something that, again, the Monsanto Center for the Study of Corn and Seed Technology, I can tell you right now, they're not looking at this. So we need some independent funding for real good science to, get, to figure out how can we grow local strains of quinoa, which I'm sure we can. Obviously, she has no issues with uh, Tyson's and Monsanto, no, as not you not. can see. <laughs> None. One more question. Oh, yeah. Hi, my question is for Ms. Gustafson. Um, would you be willing to comment, and this sort of goes back, harkens back to the GMO uh, uh, discussion as well, on the counterproductive legislation, or what I'm sure we mutually consider to be counterproductive, like the new, it was deemed the Protection of Monsanto Act or something mm -hmm. like that, where you've got international protection, you've got subsidies and everything else. It's it, it just increasing their bastion of well, protectionary spending and everything else. So, so here, here's interesting. Do you guys notice I didn't use two words? I didn't use the word organic. It's not really a word. Organic is a word, but I also didn't use GMO. I said it once, like, oh, the technology. The Supreme Court decision to, to allow the patenting of crops happened in 1980. Huh, isn't that interesting? Um, so, but, but the reason I didn't mention those two words is because I think we get into the weeds when we just talk about those specific hotbed issues. Organic is something that I'm assuming all of us understand and maybe are making those choices already. I think they are the right choices, way to go. GMO is a completely irrelevant technology. Everything it, ev everything it ever set out to do, it has failed. That's what we should be talking about. We shouldn't be talking about all the other, whether or not it's safe or not, because we might not ever win that battle, because there might never be good enough studies on that. It is a failed experiment. There is no less hunger, and there is more pesticide use. The two things that they set out to do, they have failed. So in my opinion, it's a failed technology. Unfortunately, the lobbying power of those companies is so strong that they can still embed, sneak into our, our bills. That, you know, and it's totally bipartisan, by the way. It's no, 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 no one's safe from this. No legislator is, is on top of this, really. But the, the point is, we have to destabilize those companies by not buying their crap. And that is the only real power, unless we have major campaign finance reform, the only real power is to say we will not buy that crap. We will demand that we have something different. We will go down to, the, to, 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 the, to the, um, your cafeteria here at GW and ask that they just don't buy that crap. And that is ultimately the only thing we can do to destabilize the political power of institutions like that. Another question? We have some time. Here in front. Man, all the questions are here from the front row. Hello, thank you for your presentation. Is this working? Um, so I had a question about, you were mentioning uh, about malnutrition and that although there is food available all around the world, sometimes you don't have the right kind of food available. And I was wondering about, you were talking about outsourcing the American diet, and I was, did a project recently with Feed the Future in Malawi, and we just, I found out that maize is produced by 60% of the farmers, even though it's not native to the country because it's almost, it was an export by colonizers from Mexico and the uh, Americas. So you're talking about changing our demand uh, for certain goods and making what's alternative now the norm. How do we break this concept of the interest of you know, the Western countries and change the entire global system and help countries that, like developing countries, produce the kind of products that are, gonna, that are native to them and therefore well, it, it's, in some ways, it's the same answer. It's that we have empowered colonialists of these companies because by us paying a price for their products, they're then, they have the money to go and, and conquer other, other markets, right? And the corn story is exactly the same, is that we have empowered a major corn industry to go and set up shop in places like Malawi and completely bastardize the local food systems that existed before. And, and again, Malawi is still a hungry country. So with all those 60% farmers growing maize, and then people just say, oh, the yields just have to improve, and that'll be the answer. And obviously, that's not the answer. So again, I think we have to, we have to think that our food choices here in America are so powerful that they end up in a corn farm in Malawi. And I just think we have to remember that every time we look at these big, complex issues, we actually hold the, the golden ticket sitting here as Americans. And if we don't remember that, we make a lot of our purchases. We buy cheap clothing. When we buy, we want cheap sh crap. Ugh, sorry. We have to remember that, that we, we, we hold the golden keys here. And if we don't change our purchasing habits and we don't build out the systems and disempower those businesses, that's the only way we're ever going to help people truly around the world break free from the chains that they're then into. 
Thank you. That's, sorry, but, um, that's great. Actually, this really ties into your projects, right? Because that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to affect change through food in some way. And I can't wait to see your videos, actually. Thank you so much to both of you. So, oh, we have, so Paula, next week we have uh, Food International Aid, right? Yes. Uh, food insecurity is going to be a big issue, a very important issue. Uh, really ties very well with this. And the week after, we'll have Andrew Zimmerman talking about food and pop culture, right? Yes? So anyway, we have two very fun classes coming. And I hope I'll be around for both of them. Again, thank you very much to both of you. It was a great class today. Thank you.